Welcome to ME329 Mechanical Systems Design. I'm Tom Mackin, your professor for this quarter. So what is mechanical system design? Well, what we are doing is building machines and mechanisms to address a societal need. So in mechanical engineering, we're building physical things, not software tools. We use software to control these physical things, but we're talking about building physical structures. We build things to do things. And I divide these into two sort of categories. There's essential machines and non-essential machines. And I'll just give a couple examples of each of those. Power generators are clearly essential to the functioning of our modern society. What I mean by that is electrical generators, turbines, engines, motors, all sorts of things that enable the convenience features of our modern society. Medical imaging systems to support health care. Ventilators, which has become an important topic of late. Insulin pumps. All sorts of things out there that we consider essential because they are fundamental to maintaining our way of life. But there are these non-essential things that are just plain fun, like powered scooters. We don't need it, but we have fun riding it. Trash compactors. We don't need it, but it makes our life a little bit better. Exercise machines. Well, we might need it, but they're certainly not essential and any, lots of other things that you could think of. So what is different about mechanical systems? Well, we have machined or fabricated components that carry load. They exert forces. They respond to forces. They actuate displacement. So we're talking about mechanisms that interact with the world around them and because of that, there's the transmission of forces through those mechanisms. And because of the application of those forces, those mechanisms will deflect. And we need to concern ourselves with, with when do they actually fail. They consist of physical components. So our mechanical systems are things that we can touch. They are not software things. They're not in the virtual environment. They're physical things. They use control systems. So... As mechanical engineers, we don't forget about electronics because we have to integrate sensors and software to control the functioning of our machines that specify the way the particular device will function. Now, the thing that's on everybody's mind these days because of the COVID-19 outbreak is ventilators. This is an example of a picture taken from one of these hackathons where they're trying to get a lot of people involved in building ventilator machines. And these are, these are important to think about. They're certainly important to withstanding the potential hospital surge that's going to come as more and more patients require hospitalization. So in mechanical engineering, we would design this mechanical ventilator, which blows air that can be mixed with oxygen into the patient's lungs through a tube. The air flowing to the patient passes through a humidifier, which warms the air, and it might also put extra oxygen into it, and exhaled air flows away from the patient. So that's a schematic representation of a ventilator. Here's an actual functioning ventilator right there. Now, when we think about ventilators, they have to be designed according to a specified performance. So let's talk about that for a minute. What is a ventilator? It's a breathing substitute. So it must have a controllable volume of air that we're pushing into a person's lungs. Big people will have larger lungs than smaller people. And so we have to be able to tune the ventilator so it has a controllable volume of air. I already mentioned that different people have different sized lungs. So we have to also have a controllable pressure. You gotta make sure you don't overpressurize them. You have to have enough pressure to inflate them, but not so much pressure that you damage them. You must have a controllable rate. How many breaths per minute does this person require? How many breaths per minute do they normally take? They'll feel really uncomfortable if you're forcing them to breathe, breathe slower than they normally would or faster than they normally would. They have to maintain the balance of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So we need pipes and valves and sensors in order to do that especially if we're going to be introducing oxygen into the inflow that's going into their lungs. So we have to be able to introduce that oxygen in a controlled manner, and we also want to be able to introduce 
moisture in a controlled manner. And all of this stuff has to be filtered and cleaned. And you might want it to be triggered by the patient. As, a, as the patient tries to take a breath, you might want the machine to go, oh, I noticed they're trying to take a breath. Let me help them a little bit. If they're not trying to breathe, then you're going to want to preset a pressure cycle for the patient. So that requires you to have pressure sensors that will sense when a patient wants to take a breath. But you also have to be able to override those things when you want to go to a preset breathing rate for someone who's in really critical condition. So, you know, when you're forcing the breathing, when the patient's not trying to breathe on their own, you have to be really careful about how you're controlling this particular ven ventilator machine. And you have to have alarms that can sense changes in patient performance. If something is changing, like fluid buildup in the lung, which is changing the compliance of the lungs, you have to have continuous monitoring of the pressure so that you know that something has changed and you can alert a nursing station. This all requires pumps, it requires sensors, it requires actuators, and it requires adjustable controls. All of those things are chosen by the designer to meet the user specifications at a price the user will pay. This course covers selection of mechanical components to meet specific load, lifetime, and reliability specs. Think about designing that ventilator. How long is it supposed to last? How reliable does it have to be? Those are important questions that you must ask. So the application determines the loads, and the loads that the system can handle depend upon the yield strength and the fatigue endurance limits of those components. You choose materials and geometry to meet those loads without failure for a chosen lifetime at a specified reliability. So all of these things affect your design. The application also determines the allowable deflection. When you build a bridge, how much is the bridge allowed to deflect under the load of the cars? You know, those are important questions that you have to ask. You choose materials with different elastic modulus so that they can be stiffer, for instance, so they won't deflect as much. And you choose the cross-sectional shape to keep the deflections within tolerance. The application service environment. Where is this doggone thing supposed to work? Where did you intend to use it? Is it in a clean room or is it outside in, a, in an agricultural setting? That changes a lot of your design criteria operating temperatures, chemical environment, the radiation environment, dust, dirt, all of that changes the way you design that machine. And these are all topics that we are going to be covering this quarter. And those things, of course, depend, uh, you know, the materials you select depend upon the service environment, especially when you start getting into corrosive environments. Now, What's different about trucks? Labels a 1500 versus a 2500. Do you know what's different about them? On the left is a Ram 1500. On the right is a Ram 2500. I do not own either one of these things. I just took, lifted some pictures from the web. So what's different about them? Well, it's the load capacity. The 1500 is designed for half ton loads. The 2500 for three quarter ton loads. So, uh, what do you think is going to be different about the way you design those things? So what would be different between a 1500 and a 2500? The 2500 is designed to carry heavier loads. What would you need to change in this vehicle so that it could carry higher loads than the 1500? Well, it's pretty clear they're going to need different engines. You have to pull higher loads up a hill. You're going to need more horsepower and more torque brakes you got to stop the doggone thing the 2500 weighs more so your brakes have to be designed if you want the same stopping distances the brakes have to be designed so that you can stop that heavier vehicle which means they're going to be bigger the suspension this vehicle has to carry heavier loads so it's going to have a different suspension than the one on the left the transmission is going to be different because you require a bigger engine with more torque, the gears in the transmission are going to be experiencing higher loads. 
that means you're going to have to design a different transmission in for that system. Now, you could get away with designing a transmission for the 2500 and using it in the 1500. That's a perfectly fine thing to do. But you got to make sure you design it so that it can handle the anticipated loads that you would experience in that given machine. The tires are going to be different as well. They're going to have different load ratings. So you got to have different tires. There's lots of things that will be different. The frames will be different. Lots of things will change. The couplings that attach the engine to the transmission, the transmission to the drive shaft, the drive shaft to the differential, the differentials to the wheels, all those things are going to be different because it's designed for different loads. And so where are you going to be using it? How is it intended to be used? That's the service environment it's going to be used in. And so you need to think about that as well. An off-road vehicle is designed to be used in a very different environment than an on-road vehicle. So this class studies all sorts of classical mechanical component selection, support, and attachment. We're going to look at shafts, which, which must withstand many cycles of torsional and bending loads while allowing for rotation about an axis. We support those shafts with bearings that allow for angular rotation while preventing radial and axial motion. We have to attach those bearings to a frame or a structure somewhere so we could use bolts to attach one piece to another with easy assembly and easy disassembly. We could also weld things for rapid, flexible, permanent attachment of components. We could use adhesives. They're like welds, but less critical loads. Uh, gears to transfer rotary motion between shafts at many relative orientations. Belts and chains like gears to transfer rotary motion between parallel shafts. Clutches and brakes to start and stop rotary motion through friction. This is an animation through Automate Training that illustrates some of the things that we will be talking about in this class. It includes shafts, couplings, splines, flexible couplings. You can see the splined area in there. Uh, the flexible coupling allows for steering, allows for motion. We have uh, rotary motion, but also allows for translation. These are pretty interesting concepts, and it illustrates components that we would have to size appropriately to be able to handle the service environment to which they were exposed. This is an example of an honest to God flexible coupling in a vehicle. And this shows the nice splined slip joint. Right, so there's an awful lot that we have to cover in the class. And so how are we going to do it? The first thing we're going to do is we're going to follow the guidance provided by Shigley. You have a textbook that was written by Shigley on mechanical engineering design. There, Shigley presents a lot of established and proven methods that have been time tested and validated for the design of mechanical systems. And the methods that you learn in Shigley give you a really solid baseline skill if you plan to be a designer. The equations are for relatively simple loads and geometries, but they allow validation of more complicated geometries that you would CAD up and run finite element simulations on. And so in order to get to realistic geometries, we're also going to introduce you to a CAD package that runs decent FEA. Right, now, uh, this, this methodology that we're choosing is what I like to call digital hands-on or learn by digital doing. You have to become really good at using computers and computer software if you're going to be a designer of the future because what you can make in the shop is not as important any longer as compared with what you can make in a computer. You're going to design and simulate things before you start building them. So the sooner you feel comfortable with computer software, the better off you're going to be. Anytime we come across equations in Shigley, a, an example of an Excel spreadsheet, we're going to be generalizing whatever equations we can, and we're going to you know, input stuff into a yellow box, and we're going to calculate things that come out of the, in an orange box. We'll, we'll color the, the cells that way. And we're going to generalize the equation so that once you figure out how to write the spreadsheet, you can solve problems really quickly. It really accelerates the design timeline. 
We're also going to go back to doing CAD again. How you might have thought you were done with it when you finished 251 and you probably learned SOLIDWORKS, not Fusion 360. But CAD is CAD. You're going to learn another program. You can't guarantee what program your employer will have you use. And so we're going to teach you another one, Fusion 360. We're going to CAD up some complicated parts and we're going to run finite element analysis on those parts. Computer-aided design allows us to do lots of cool things like animate the motion of components and get a really good visualization of how those components are interacting, how they behave. And we can also then extend that into much more complicated stress analysis. In addition to just animating the gears, we can draw gears in Fusion 360, as I've shown here, a pair of meshing gears. Uh, you can see the topological mesh that's used to do the calculation of the stresses. We apply a load on one of the teeth on the right side over here, and we look at the contact stress distribution. Uh, very high stresses at the, at the direct tooth load and distributed stresses because we have more than one tooth in contact of the meshing gears. And so this Fusion 360 is an incredibly powerful tool. We can create a slice plane, and once we have that slice plane, we can move through and take a look and explore this internal stress distributions throughout the parts that we CAD up and run the FAA on. This is an incredibly powerful tool for us to figure out the stresses that are acting in much more complicated shapes, stresses that would be really hard to analyze without an F finite element analysis package. We're also going to apply basic physics to the problems. We're going to use energy methods, static free body diagrams, dynamics, and perhaps MATLAB, Simulink, and Simscape to help us solve important problems. The adventure begins, and I think you're going to find it a very pleasant journey. We're going to use a lot of interesting new tools to help us become better mechanical engineering designers. See you soon.